Um, I'm the moderator for this uh, session, and uh, I want to welcome our panelists and the attendees for making time to attend this uh, webinar. Um, as we all know, rape and uh, sexual uh, violence is a pandemic in our country. And we see the perpetrators coming from different social classes. Now, over the, the past um, years, and even during this uh, pandemic, the lockdown, and over the past few weeks, we've seen a number of actions, interventions taken by civil society and the police and government uh, agencies, you know, to, to cope this menace. Uh, the Child Rights Act has been passed. Uh, so many states have signed on. We have about 13 or 14 states signed on to the VAP Act, this Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. Um, a state of emergency, you know, has been declared on, on rape. Uh, we, we've seen the, the, uh, the National Assembly uh, passing steep uh, penalties for uh, sexual uh, abuse uh, in, in our institutions of learning and uh, psychosocial support is being given to, to uh, victims, shelters have been set up and so on and so forth. So there's all that that is going on. And um, we have seen uh, that perpetrators, uh, some are religious people, uh, some of the incidents are happening in religious places. You know, we're having uh, children dead, found dead in a, in, a, in, 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 in abandoned places, in mosques, in, in churches. So we think that it's very important for us to have this conversation and look at, well, in the, in, in, in the civic world, we can see a lot of actions being taken. Now, what about our faith communities and our religious um, organizations and our religious leaders? What should be their response? You know, seeing that uh, the, the matter we are dealing with, it's, uh, it is, 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 is something that should be of great concern, uh, given the priorities that uh, our religions place on human life and bodily integrity. Uh, so this is a very important conversation that uh, we think we should have to look beyond uh, the issues or the complaining or even these um, measures that are being taken to respond and to think of what are the proactive things that we, we can do, religious leaders can do, you know, to prevent what we are uh, dealing with. And that is why uh, we have focused this uh, webinar on how to end it. It's not enough to be responding to the incidents as they are coming. There has to be also an attack on how to make sure that uh, these problems don't keep coming up and then we keep trying to, to, to catch up and uh, call for access to justice and so on. So to lead us in this conversation today, we have two lead uh, speakers, uh, Father, um, Reverend Father George Ehusani, who is the Executive Director of Luxterra Foundation, uh, we have Sheikh Nuruddin Lemu, the Director of Islamic Trust Education. They will be speaking for 15 minutes each. Then we have two discussants, Dr. Chichi Anyagolo uh, Okoye, the Country Director of TechnoSev. And uh, Mr. Omabishe Baru is the CEO of Learning Impact NG. Now, these uh, speakers, we can always go uh, online and look at um, who they are, but there's something they have in common. You know, it's not about, you know, the things they've achieved or the positions they hold. These are people who are leaders and are very committed to the cause of social justice and uh, interfaith collaboration as well. And they have uh, set up organizations and led organizations and initiatives, you know, to make sure that there's uh, social justice um, in the society. Now, before I call the speakers, uh, I would just talk about how we are going to manage this session. The host, uh, of course, is muting all mics and uh, all videos are turned off. Uh, we are encouraging people to send their questions to the Q&A box. So if we have any questions for any of the speakers, we'll send those to the Q&A box. And uh, please specify who uh, among the speakers that question is directed uh, to, to make it uh, easy for us to 
uh, to proceed. We will take a few comments also, but it will just be two minutes and just a few people. We are not going to have time to accommodate all the questions, so I apologize ahead of time because we have hundreds of people that have registered you know, uh, for this and we won't be able to take uh, everybody, but we do as much as we can. So um, welcome again to this uh, webinar. Now I will call on our first um, speaker, Reverend Father George Ehusani, to take the... Father George, we can't hear you. You are muted. You have to unmute. Great. Thank you, everyone who is um, online now. Particularly, I want to thank our collaborators, uh, the Community Life Project, Gozi Wiri and her uh, companions, her co colleagues. I want to thank my colleagues on the panel, uh, Sheikh Lemu, Nuruddin Lemu, uh, Chichi Anyakolo Koye, um, Omabwishe Baru. The issue of the embarrass, I would say the embarrassing upsurge in rape is something that should concern all of us and give us perhaps sleepless nights as to what must we do to bring this plague, this pestilence to an end, to reduce drastically this pestilence. It is true that we have always had, hum human history has always had incidences of rape, but they were few and far between and considered an abomination. Rape has always belonged to those crimes that are considered abominable, meaning that we shouldn't hear of it. And perhaps that is part of the reason why there was a lot of, there was the regime of silence. Thank God that today um, the social media has helped so that people are now more uh, able to speak out about rape victims are able to come out to, 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 to say that they have been raped. Neighbors are able to report. But the long history of rape and perhaps what is behind uh, the silence, the regime of silence, is that it is such a heinous crime. It is such an abominable crime uh, that um, families would not want to hear that any of their people uh, it, it has this scourge, this disease, this ailment, this, this um, accursed um, behavior. Now, what we have seen in the last few years in our country is that there is an upsurge. There appears to be an upsurge. And then, like Ngozi said in her introduction, from high-level people to low-level people, we are hearing of, of uh, big executives uh, raping their house girls, raping their staff. We are hearing of teachers, professors, raping their students. Uh, unfortunately, we have even heard occasionally of pastors and priests raping members. This is abominable. This is perverse. This should not be heard of. But unfortunately, we now need to talk about it and do whatever we must to bring it to an end. In the last two weeks, the Archbishop of Abuja issued a statement where he um, described rape as uh, some of the most heinous crimes in, in life and that rape inflicts, I quote, rape inflicts lifelong untold psychological trauma on the victim. It is not only a grievous sinful act, but also a very barbar barbaric and criminal act, unquote. This is how uh, Archbishop uh, Ignatius Kaigama of Abuja describes it. He says, we hope that the perpetrators of such heinous crimes will face the full rot of the law and hopefully they will be reformed and delivered of the bad spirit, the bad spirit that leads them to commit such horrible crimes, said Archbishop uh, Kaigama. The same week, uh, 29th of June, uh, Archbishop of Lagos, Alfred Martins, also issued a statement of condemnation against rape. He says, rape is not only a serious crime against the victim, it is also a gross violation of the sacredness of the person's body and an affront on the Almighty God. The Almighty God in whose image and likeness we have all been created, as we read in the book of Genesis. We are all created, we say, in the image of God, in his image and likeness, and God created us as good. Because of that creation in God's image, we Christians believe, 
we are our bodies are sacred and St. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians, to, to, uh, the letter to the 1 Corinthians, he says, don't you know that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? So your bodies are sacred and may not be violated, must not be violated. So Archbishop uh, um, Alfred Martins says that such persons clearly uh, have gone outside rational human behavior. And I would next say that there are elements in our society that render or facilitate this kind of behavior. And I would like us to quickly see it before I talk about what the religious bodies should do. We have a long history of it, the human propensity in general to abuse all forms of power. Those who rape others are people who believe that they have some power over those they rape. So the propensity to abuse power, any kind of power, a religious leader having power over members of his or her congregation, a teacher having power over a student, an employer having power over an employee or potential employee, a father having power over a child, an uncle having power over a small child, so the propensity of human beings to abuse power is one uh, factor that we need to uh, uh, take into consideration. This is why societies make laws and have laws and regulations to regulate the, uh, the use of that power, the exercise of such power, in order to protect the weak against the strong and the powerful. Two, we have a long history of male ch chauvinism or primitive patriarchy and what some have come to call the abuse of male privilege, by which the female folk were often seen simply as um, objects to be possessed uh, and treated um, as he wishes by, by the male folk, as if the female ha has a lesser dignity and honor than her male folk. And uh, in the best case scenario, the people just think that women or female children are, are lesser and that um, men, ma the male child is uh, more honorable, which is a lie, which is unacceptable, and our Christian religion rejects that outright. Um, people treat their wives as if they possess their wives. I'm one of those who has been campaigning that, look, we need to do something about this bright prize especially bride price by which people pay big money uh, to marry and now begin to behave as if they actually bought the, the woman. Next is, there is a blood line or a terrible confusion between sexual attraction and sexual satisfaction. Sexual attraction as such can be innocent and natural, but between sexual attraction and sexual assault, there is a big chasm. Now, as human beings, we can experience sexual attraction, and it is innocent. Then we need, when children are growing up, particularly in families, they need to be taught what is called deferred gratification. They need to be taught about how to handle their impulses, their desires, to make sure that they don't behave like animals. Their desires need to be subjected to rationality, to reasoning. So, when that line between sexual attraction and sexual satisfaction is blurred or confused, then we run into serious problems as we are seeing now. The mosques, the churches, religious organizations, schools, we must all be up and doing in teaching people the difference between sexual attraction and sexual satisfaction. There has not been sufficient training in sexuality, not just sex education, but training in how to manage our sexual reproductive powers. There needs to be a lot more work in our churches. There needs to be a lot more work in our mosques to train people to handle and use to the glory of God, the wonderful power to procreate that God has given us in our sexuality. That one, we need to develop curricula. We need to develop uh, teaching aids to help from elementary school, from nursery school to the university, there needs to be, the general studies department of universities need to put in a lot of training 
because these are teenagers and people who have just gone through puberty to train them on their sexuality and how to handle the difference between sexual attraction and sexual satisfaction. Now, then there is the terrible scourge in our day of the objectification of the female body. We have turned the female body to an object for entertainment. We have turned the female body to an object to sell products. You see all kinds of advertisement and they are using the female body. You are using this female body to sell toothpaste, female body to sell a bottle of wine, female body to sell a car. I want to call on all those who are involved in this, all the agencies and all agencies of government and civil society agents and religious bodies to get into serious advocacy to stop using the female body as uh, an object, uh, as an object for uh, pleasure, for the man's pleasure and for entertainment. The dignity and sacredness of the human or the female body must be constantly rejected. And this advertisement, a lot of the advertisements violate that sacredness and, and, and dignity of the female uh, body. Then um, the, the uh, emptiness in our public square today. Today, our public square appears empty, meaning naked of values. What we are seeing today with rape cannot be taken in isolation. It has to be taken in union with what we see with corruption, where somebody is a governor today, the next day he is paraded or he is um, charged to court for monumental corruption. That's not good for the psyche of young people. Uh, uh, today, somebody is, uh, is, is a governor. I remember, I mean, it, it's very bad. This thing has a long history. During the military rule in this country, there are cases of secondary school girls being sent uh, when a governor is visiting a, a town, secondary school girls being sent as call girls uh, like prostitutes to satisfy the terrible um, sexual passion, passion of, uh, of, the, of the leaders, of the governor and his entourage. That happened during the military rule in this country. And I know that similar things are still happening, perhaps not as openly. So there is emptiness in our public square. Uh, morals have gone, values have gone, and what we have is, with our young people particularly, what we have is sheep without shepherd. This is where the religious bodies need to come in big time. We are the ones who pride ourselves in being the teachers of values, the teachers of morals. We say that that is our territory. No one can do it better than us because our religious books, the Quran, the Bible, uh, and the various uh, regulations of our, none of them um, <coughs> encourages any perverse sexual behavior. In fact, if you look at Christianity, it has the most puritanical uh, uh, laws and regulations. Jesus Christ says that to even look at somebody lustfully, no action, but to think in your mind lustfully, is already, you're already committing adultery in your heart. He says, you are told in Exodus chapter 20, you are told uh, that you shall not commit adultery, the sixth commandment. But he says, I tell you, anyone who looks at another person, at a woman, or this, in our case today, both men and women, lustfully, such a person has already committed adultery in his or her heart. Now, this is very serious. And St. Paul says, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit that may not be violated. So there is no question that our Christian religion has very strict legislation, very strict um, moral precepts with regards to our behavior uh, in sexuality. Christians permit sex only within marriage, within properly constituted marriage, and nowhere else. So where people, people can be going to church and be engaged in sex outside marriage, that is horrible already, not to talk of violent behavior in sex. That one is crazy and must be dealt with as a social pathology. Christianity will repudiate that in the harshest terms. Now, there is a high degree of social pathology in Nigeria, meaning that many people are sick. All the stories I have been hearing this year about rape, they demonstrate to me that we are not dealing with healthy people. We are dealing with sick minds. A lot of the Perhaps most of those who are guilty of this sexual perversion in our society today perhaps needs to be in the asylum. They need to be locked away. 
because people who have a bit of reasoning um, cannot do the kind of things that we see and we hear that they are doing. I mean, how can a 20-year-old person, a 50-year-old person go and lie down with a 10-year-old? If that happens, then that means there is something that has not developed properly in the brain, or um, definitely the person needs psychiatric attention. The person needs to be locked away in an asylum with psychiatrists taking care or clinical psychologists taking care of the person. In our society, we have not given sufficient consideration for mental health. And these are part of the things we are harvesting. We are harvesting these crimes, these heinous crimes, because we have not given sufficient attention to mental health in our society. I insist that a lot of these cases we are hearing are psychiatric cases that need psychiatric uh, attention. And we cannot take that in isolation from the other uh, um, misbehaviors in our society. Look at the way our people drive. Look at the way people behave like hooligans all over the place. So these are evidences that we do have a major uh, psychosocial uh, problem that need to be addressed. Then there is the resurgence of primitive superstition. We say we are Christians. So many of us say we are Christians. Half of the population of Nigeria say we are Christians. But there is a resurgence. There is more superstition in Nigeria today than when I was born 62 years ago. People are, I'm told that people are sleeping with children in order to make them rich. That people are sleeping with children, call such people Christians or Muslims. We, we need to say clearly, we need to dissociate ourselves from such people. And if we name them, name them and shame them because this cannot be associated with Christianity in any way. So um, what we are seeing today is a resurgence a revival of primitive superstition that, that will make somebody, I mean, I have heard of people taking somebody to the graveyard to, to sleep in order to get something. Now, what we're talking about is that we have numerous people in our churches, but perhaps we who are leaders, pastors and imams, have often failed in our teaching, in our catechesis, in our education, and we need to constantly reinvent re, 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 re ourselves reinvent our methods and and if we find you know uh, that that we are not succeeding using particular methods then we need to change our methods now finally i would like to to say that religious leaders need to play leading roles in collaboration with the agency the civil society agencies uh, I, I have to commend uh, the we are tired uh, group the various agencies that took part in we are tired uh, NAPKIP and all other agencies, we need to congratulate them for the work they are doing. We are supposed to be in the forefront, religious leaders. We are so, because this is an affront on a society that says it's Christian, a society that says it's Muslim. It's an affront. We need to take the leadership and uh, lead people back to God, as it were. Because what we are seeing is the loss of the sense of the sacred, loss of the sense of God, loss of the fear of God. That's what we are seeing exhibited in this terrible incidents that we are having. We need to advocate for a major change in the way we look at rape and how we treat offenders and how we treat the unfortunate victims. Never should the victim um, have the impression that she, she has done something shameful. The victim is always a victim and should be treated with compassion with all sense of sympathy and society should come together to help the person. A person who is raped is never guilty of the offense. So a situation where rape victims are too ashamed to come out because of the stigmatization of the society, we religious leaders should do a lot, should do everything within our power to, to disabuse society of that kind of idea and um, celebrate any rape victim that is able to come out, celebrate him or her, and then protect him or her, send him or her to, to rehabilitation to, for some kind of psychological rehabilitation, so support the person in whatever way, even when the case of rape has not yet been fully proved. Because for somebody to come out to say, I am raped, there is a problem. And such problem needs to be addressed, whether we are able to prove it or not, the allegation or not. Then, Father, so, I'm going to interject a bit, Father, uh, because of time, I'm going to interject a bit. Uh, you have a few minutes to round up, please. 
Good. So I'll, I'll round up in two minutes. Now, the, the, the um, uh, improve our legal system. Uh, the, today's legal system, judicial system in Nigeria is, is not adequate to be able to deal with these problems. The police, for example, I mean, people are raped and they go to the police and the police start asking, what were you wearing? What, what, time, what time of the day was it? What were you wearing? Uh, you are the cause. You called it for it. Now we need to educate the police a lot of our police are not are not sensitive to these issues, especially when it comes to the female sex. They are not sensitive because they themselves are often male chauvinists. We perhaps need to set up units within the police, units that are specially specialized in this, that are trained to handle rape cases, not just anybody on the counter. We, we, we need to equip such a unit, support such a unit, Religious bodies need to support such units within the police and work with them when there is any report. Because often the rape victim goes to the pastor or goes to the priest or goes to the imam to report. If that happens, then we should be the ones to help to make sure that the law works perfectly. Next is that uh, we need, uh, while admonishing Christians and Muslims to be modest in their dress, preachers should stop giving any excuse for rape. Nigerians should stop excusing the rape perpetrator by saying that the rape victim did not dress properly. Yes, we will encourage modesty. We keep preaching modesty. But no one who is a victim of rape is ever the guilty one. It is the one who could not control his or her uh, impulses that is guilty. So we should stop saying, oh, the reason why this rape happened is because somebody was not well dressed. Next, finally, we need to constantly teach our, our people deferred gratification. What we see in the social media, look at Hush Puppy, Woodbury, uh, E-Money, all this, today is instant gratification. Now, instant gratification in money, but also the spirit of instant gratification can easily go to sexual perversion, where you are attracted and you cannot hold yourself. So if you cannot hold yourself and you must uh, express your your, your desire, your sexual desire, you must satisfy it instantly, then it means you have not learned self-control. And we Christians are told, Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, list the fruits of the Spirit and self-control is key. So we need to teach self-control, deferred gratification, self-mastery. from, And that should begin from the family. When I want to end by saying, when people say, oh, church, church, uh, most, what are you doing? I say, what are you doing as fathers and mothers? Because developmental psychology says by the time a child is five years, that child has already been destroyed or be made. So families need to do a lot of work in order that their children will grow to be more humane, more human, more compassionate, uh, and more sensible. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for this very incisive uh, presentation that you have made. Uh, I'm going to call on Sheikh 